I gave my life for thee. Oh, 
song number one. Number one. F. Key F. with song 262 as we welcome the ministers
Shall we pray? Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you this Sabbath morning. We thank you for allowing us to gather here to worship you, dear God. We pray, Lord, that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will give us your word. We pray that you will revive us, that after we leave this place, we will have both healing of our physical bodies, healing of our minds, and I pray above all that you will give us spiritual healing and restore us to a place where we can commune with you, for we pray this in Jesus' name. on behalf of the church pastor and the church leadership to welcome all of us to the divine hour and the divine service uh, for this uh, afternoon. The week that has ended or the week that is ending today has been brought to us by the health ministry department. Uh, I know they have an elaborate program that has run this far, and they still have some parts of the program remaining. So at the opportune time, we will be able to give you an update on the same, uh, so that we can know uh, what program to expect. But before that, I want to invite my brother Vincent, brother Vincent Mogeni, for a minute of an update before we can have the announcements. Happy Sabbath. In front, I want to give an update of the COVID-19 in Kenya and in our county, Nakuru. As of yesterday, the total number of people in Kenya who have contracted the COVID-19 surpassed the 100,000 mark and the number stands at 1,563. Recovered cases from the 100,000 in Kenya stands at 83,821. The deaths of those who have contracted COVID and passed on in Kenya stands as of yesterday at 1,000 753. The fatality rate, that is a 1.7% of the total number, and the recovery rate is at 83.4%. Those in ICU as of yesterday in Kenya, they are 27 in number, and the daily cases that are for treatment are 14,000 989. We come to Nakuru County. Nakuru County, as of yesterday, has a total number of people who have contracted COVID standing at 4,786. Recovered cases, 3,850. Deaths in Nakuru County stand at 57. In Nakuru County, as of yesterday, Nakuru Provincial General Hospital has got four cases of COVID. Naivasha District Hospital has one case. And uh, the Langalanga Sub-County Hospital has one case. What we are learning is that since the schools reopened, the cases have really subsided. We don't know why but we want to believe that the pandemic looks like is drifting away from our county. But that said, we need to keep on observing the MOH protocols by putting on our masks when we are in the public area, when 
we go to supermarkets, there is that washing our hands and checking our temperatures so that this pandemic can be kept away. Coming to our church here, we advise that in our church, all of us, your masks should be above the nose. If you see a friend, if you see a neighbor whose mask is down, kindly tap him and tell him to pull up his mask. In this church, we have one entrance, we have two exits, and we advise that if you are seated inside here, you use the exits to the go when you want to go to the washrooms. And when you are coming back, don't use the exits, use the entry. At the entry there, we have sanitizers. Sanitize yourself, and then you come. We are also saying that once we finish our services, we do not um, allow or we do not uh, allow people to congregate out there in groups. Once we finish our service and we're saying we go home, let's adhere to those directions. Thank you so much. That is the COVID update as of yesterday. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Brother Vincent, for that. Uh, these are the announcements that we have for today. Uh, the first is to appreciate the department, uh, the health uh, ministries department that has led us through the week. And as I indicated earlier, they have a program for us. And the program is that we will have a part two. What we have this morning is a part one. The presentation will be part one. In the afternoon, beginning at 2.30 for an hour, we have a session that will be part two of uh, the program. The program will both be physical for those of us who will be able to come in. The sanctuary will be prepared for you. But we also encourage for those of us who are not able to be here physically to follow the program online. We will have it on our various live stream channels. So you are encouraged to kindly follow up on that. The week that starts sunset today will be uh, led by the Sabbath School Department. I know the department has already planned for it, but uh, we are reminding those of us who are in the Sabbath School Council to, con uh, to convene briefly after the divine service to meet with your head of department to just put uh, up in place a few things that may be required for the week to be a success. So the health, uh, sorry, the Sabbath School Council, you are reminded to consult with your leader immediately after the divine service. The next announcement goes to the de deaconry department, deacons and deaconesses. There will be a training, an induction training for deacons and deaconesses that will be led by our church pastor on Sunday the 7th of February, 2021, which is in a week's time. So the deaconry department, the deacons and deaconesses, take note. The training starts at exactly 9 a.m., and we are encouraged to keep time. If there is any member of the department that may not get this uh, update, you will receive it through your head deacon and head, head deaconesses. We are also reminded, the heads of department, that we need to have our councils in place. Those who have not formed their councils, kindly urgently come up with your councils as well as the departmental budgets which will be ratified in the next regular church board meeting. The second Sunday of February we will have our regular church board meeting and therefore those names for the council members as well as your budgets should have reached uh, the office of the pastor and the church clerk before that so that the names can be ratified. For those of us who work in the health sector, healthcare workers, we are requested to briefly consult immediately after the divine service, so spare a moment and consult with the head of the health ministries department, Brother Walter, for a brief update and a few things that need to be agreed upon. And finally, I want to remind us again that we have a 2.30 p.m. program 
which will be part two of the presentation, and we look forward to seeing all of us. For the visitors that may be in our midst, feel welcome, feel at the feet of Jesus, and if you find time to visit with us again, you are welcome to visit and to worship with us as regularly as possible. Now I want to take this opportunity to introduce to us the ministers of the day, those of us that will be serving from the pulpit. I want to start from my father, farthest uh, right, Brother Walter Osoro, who is the head of the Health Ministries Department. If you could kindly rise and say hi. Thank you so much. Next to him is our speaker for the children. She has the children uh, summon, Sister Efe. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Thank you. To speak to us today is uh, a friend of the church and a colleague in the healthcare sector. Her name is uh, Dr. Diane Owino. But before I welcome her to rise, she didn't come alone. So kindly, if you know you came with her, kindly rise so that we can introduce you. Thank you so much. This is Brother Wino. I, I'm sure he's, how many of us know him by chance? Maybe, let me just break the protocol. If you could take out your mask for a minute so that people can see the face, they could relate to the face. Thank you so much. You can have it back. So this is Brother Wino. Brother Wino and Sister Diana are a couple. I know she will have a better way to introduce him, but uh, for purposes of my introduction, he came with the spouse and we are glad to have them today. So Brother Wino, feel welcome as we worship together. Sister Diane will rise at her opportune moment. She will introduce her better, but for now, if she could just wave to the congregation. Thank you so much and feel welcome as we worship together this hour. Happy Sabbath, happy day. I request that we stand with our hymns and the Bibles. I request that we stand those outside, please. We are going to read from the book of Jeremiah, third verse 17. Jeremiah, 30, 17. If we are there, we I read, for I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, say the Lord, because they call thee an outcast, saying, this is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. Let's see our hymns, song uh, 516, all of the way. Hold us, please. i 
Our Father, our Savior and Redeemer, this morning we come before you. We praise your name because there is none like you, God. Thank you for the things that you have done to us, the things we can see and the one we cannot see. We praise your name, God, because you have been good unto us. We live on times which are so difficult. We live on times of diseases, O oh God. But because of your goodness, you have taken care of us, not because we are good, but because you love us as your children. Amidst us, I know, God, there are those people who need you, who need you in their spiritual walk, O oh Father, who need you in their physical walk, emotional, psychological, and all ways, so oh God. We pray that because you are our creator and that you know our needs, may you provide. We take the opportunity, God, to pray for our health. May you restore 
our elder of God, that we may find time to serve you. We take the opportunity to remember those who are in the hospitals, those who are even lying in the homes. May you heal them, because, Father, we know you can. I know there are so many needs amid us. Even as we commune with you, Father, we pray that may you search our hearts. Put pure hearts in us, which are led, O God, to do your work. Provide where we need. We pray for the church leadership. Even as we have begun this year, O oh God, we need you because you have good plans for our lives. Because without you, all of these things will not come to succeed. But we pray, may you lead us. As the speaker whom you have assigned to speak to us today stands, may you speak through her to us, Father, that the word may find a place that it may bear fruits. For the things that we have not prayed for, God, we pray that may you intercede for us. For this is our prayer, we pray in Jesus' name. A prayer, O Lord. A prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear to us and grant us thy time for, uh, for us to worship in our giving, our tithes, and our offerings. And as the deaconry uh, team that is on duty rises to minister to us, I want to just remind us that we have two uh, modalities of paying or returning our tithes and offering. Number one that we strongly recommend is the cashless method. And for the cashless method, we have two options. The option number one is to use our church pay bill, pay bill number 856121, which I believe will be projected in a moment. When you choose to use that option, under the account, you will specify what you are giving for. For example, if you are paying 1,000 shillings, and part of the 1,500 goes to your tithes, and the other 500 goes to your offering or your church development. Under the account, you will specify tithe in bracket 500, and then offering 300, church development 200. For, that is an example. So you are uh, encouraged to use that method. Cashless method number two that we have is that you can use the church finance management system, CFMS. I believe we have registered, and if you have not registered, you can get in, in touch with the treasury department to guide you on how to give using that avenue. For those of us who may not have that option or the two options available for us and have carried cash with them, we still have that option available for us. At the front, on my right-hand side, there, there is an offering box. So when that time comes, when we will have done our prayer, if you want to give your offering in cash, kindly come in an orderly manner. Ensure we have sufficient uh, social distance between the person in front of you and yourself as we give our offering. So I want to offer a prayer. May the deaconry department, uh, the ushers that are ministering, rise. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for giving sinners like us an opportunity to worship you through our tithes and offerings. Dear God, as we return our offerings, 
and tithes, dear God, we pray that you may bless them. We thank you even for those of us who may not have an opportunity to worship you in that service today. And we pray that, dear God, may you all open your heavenly gates to us that we may have something to return to your kitty in the subsequent Sabbath. We also thank you even for those of us who have. We pray that as we give it, dear God, may we give ourselves first as the true sacrifice, dear Father. We thank you because you have heard and answered our prayer. For we have prayed in Jesus' name. I invite the choristers to take us through a singing session as we get served in the tithes and offerings. Thank you. Song 308, Holy Thine, is uh, collect the offering. I will be the Savior, Holy Thine, G. I will be the Savior, Holy for coming to church today. My name is Effie and I'll be giving the children someone for today. But before that, let us pray. Thank you God for giving us a chance to be in your sanctuary today. And as we are getting ready to listen to, your, to our story, may you take captive of our minds as children. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Once upon a time, there lived a man and a woman and they were so happy together. One day, God blessed them with a child, and they named the child Bobby. Bobby was a joyful child. And the day Bobby was born, people came with gifts, and a lot of gifts, just like they came during the birth of Jesus. And they sang songs to welcome the baby to the society. When it was time for the baby to start feeding, the parents fed the baby well. But something bad kept on happening any time the baby was fed with animal protein. The baby could start scratching and swelling, and the parents were worried what could be happening to our child. And just like our parents, love, love, just like our parents do love us, when we are sick, they rush us to hospital. So they went to hospital and they said to the doctor, how their boy becomes sick when, they, when he drinks milk, takes eggs. And the doctor promised them the boy will be fine only if they adjust his diet and modify his diet 
so that he cannot. And he was healthy and strong. But the parents never explained to him. One day they told him, never take these eggs and don't drink too much milk because you're going to be sick. But the boy didn't understand. So one day there was an emergency at the village and the parents rushed to the village to see the, Bobby's grandmother because Bobby's grandmother was sick. And there was a party next door. Bobby thought, ah, oh, this is going to be a good day for me because I am going to try something. Just like some of us try doing wrong things when our parents are not at home, which is very bad manners. So Bobby went to the neighbors and he went there and there was a lot of food. But because he knew he's only supposed to take vegetables and plant proteins, he decided this time he's not going to do that. So he went and he started drinking milk. He ate eggs and all. Oh, he saw sausages and he ate all this, almost all the sausages. And still people were wondering, what is wrong with this boy? He ate and ate until he could not even stand. He went home walking like this. He was tired of eating bad food that the doctor has said he shouldn't eat. In the evening, Bobby started becoming sick. He was scratching and sweating. He was vomiting. And when the parents came home, they found Bobby trembling. And he was, he was saying like he's feeling like dying. And he was so sick, he was crying. Bobby's mommy really cried. It was a sad moment. Bobby's mommy took Bobby back to hospital. And Bobby promised ever that he will never disobey his parents and the doctors. And you know, till today, Bobby accepted his diet and he's a strong boy. He obeyed his parents and God is pleased with him. And do you know, even in the Bible, there were four boys, Daniel, Meshach, Abednego, and Shadrach, who were tried with uh, meals from the king, but they said no, and they told the king to try them with fruits and vegetables for 10 days. And after the 10 days, they were stronger than anyone. What do we learn from this story? That as children, we should obey our parents. And even from the word of God, we should obey. And you know something? Health is wealth. When we take care of our health, we are going to be wealthy and God will bless us, not only as children, but even in our days to come. May God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sister Effie. How many together with me uh, invite the speaker of the hour, Sister Diane, to speak to us? Thank you so much, Sister Diane. You are welcome. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. I'm glad to come once again to Nakuru Krita SDA Church. I think I've been here before many years ago. Um, and I thank God for allowing us to come here um, with my husband. He's my right-hand man. Um, and I thank God that he always finds the time to, to serve God together with myself. Um, we, I want to thank Walter for inviting us and this morning we have a very special and interesting subject which will continue straight to the afternoon. Allow me to leave this here. The subject this morning is home health systems and these a lot to learn from the Word of God, um, especially concerning our health. I have been working at the front line since the beginning of the pandemic in the biggest isolation center. Um, and I have dealt with COVID cases right from the beginning. Up to now, I still deal with COVID cases and having been a patient myself of COVID, I can tell you for a fact that there is a bigger pandemic in the house of God than COVID itself. 
and that pandemic is the lack of realization that we are living at the edge or right at the edge of time and we are too concerned about following government protocol instead of following the word of God. For if we were found following the word of God, the pandemic would not be a shocker, isn't it? If we had been found living according to the word of God, we would not be so shaken by the pandemics. And I can tell you, there is bigger and there is more to come because for me as a doctor dealing with patients suffering from COVID, I can see with almost surety that there is worse coming that the church is not prepared for. But we sit and hope that, you know, peace will come. But the Bible says, while they were saying peace, peace, then sudden destruction came, isn't it? And that's why today I want us to discuss the subject of home health systems. I hope it can be put up because I believe that when we engage all our senses, our mental, our visual, our hearing, our writing, the lessons stick more and much better than if I just spoke with you. And so I'll, I'll wait until he puts this up. All right. And thereafter we can just start. All right, I think we may have to do without the visuals for today, for this session, and then in the afternoon we will set this up. Around a century ago, in the year 1931, the China floods was one of the devastating issues or pandemics that the world faced. China faced one of the worst and greatest catastrophes of the age. The 1931 China floods is documented to have affected the largest population of all disasters. In fact, I dare say almost bigger than COVID. It covered 180,000 square kilometers the water levels rose to 16 meters, and if you want to estimate what 16 meters is, it's way above the height of this building, yeah? Mr. Engineer, what's the height of this building? About four or five meters, right? So 16 meters is way above the height of this building. And this was caused by heavy spring rain and melting snow and ice. The floods caused deaths of 3.7 to 4 million people, 25 million people were affected, um, 150,000 people drowned, the rest died out of starvation, diseases, and just the effect of the floods. Many were forced to move from their houses and farmlands, and it did not just cause death and disease, it also caused an economic shock that affected the rest of the world. With no food, people were reduced to eating tree bark, weeds, and earth. Some sold their children to survive, while others resorted to cannibalism. For anyone to have survived the 1931 China floods, people needed to move to higher ground. The most lethal effect of the flood were the diseases that swept through the refugee population due to displacement, overcrowding, and the breakdown of sanitation. The diseases included things like cholera, measles, malaria, dysentery, and schistom schistosomiasis. Um, and anyone who needed to move 
people to survive had to move from their homes and set their homes on higher ground. And so today I want to invite us to set our homes and our lifestyle in the homes on higher grounds. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we want to ask that, Lord, you will speak to us, that you'll pour your word and your Holy Spirit upon us. I ask, Heavenly Father, that this morning you will heal us, not just physically, but you'll heal us of all the spiritual diseases, emotional diseases, and prepare us for your second coming, for we pray this in Jesus' name. We live in a distressed world. There is famine, drought, and starvation, and stress, like the WHO says, has become one of the world's biggest pandemics. In a fast-paced world of stress from comparisons, pressure to keep life afloat through tough economic times, where depression seems to be caused by anything and everything, and bills and loans and taxes seem to be causing everyone to go down. In fact, at the end of the month, we find that there is more month left than money, and lots of people become diseased because of the stress that we are facing. In the times we live in, full of uncertainties, fears, and hopes alike, especially in matters of health, my mind is compelled to find a man or family from whom I can find lessons for such a time as this. And when the pandemic was starting, my husband and I began to study the life of one such man, and we documented the lessons in a book we've titled Families in Quarantine. It is from one of the lessons in this book that we will borrow heavily today from. The rest you can obtain the book and just read. And I realized from studying the story of this man for over a year that there is nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 says. The problem of floods droughts and even pandemics is one that has been cyclic since the beginning of the world. It is from one such experience that I choose to share the lessons of health today. Higher grounds are needed if anyone is to survive the flood of disease that is upon the earth today. And Noah, living at a time where a pandemic was looming, so in faith what he ought to do, and he didn't just see it, he was willing to follow through and live out what God had asked him to do. He chose to live his life on higher ground, and I begin to trail his story from the book of Genesis chapter 6 verse 9. The Bible says, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. The Bible tells us of a man who had been found perfect before God, and not just him, he was perfect in his generations. I know traditionally, as you read the Bible, the problem of sin has been considered a generational problem. But today I want to look at disease as a generational problem. Genesis chapter 7 verse 1 says, I have seen righteousness before me in this generation. The whole verse says, And the Lord God said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into thy ark, for in thee I have seen righteousness before me in this generation. This sounds to me like a description that was given to a man and his household after Noah, that he will command his children and his household after me. That is the book of Genesis chapter 18 verse 19. The Bible says concerning Abraham, that I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. Now, sin is a generational problem, and so is health. And this morning, I choose to share with us three health concerns. If you're taking notes, the first concern is generational health, the second concern is mindsets, and the third concern is mission and vision. And I do encourage you to take notes, for like I said, the mind is a very pliable and, um, and an object that can easily forget information unless you engage all the senses. I like telling students that the reason why even in an age of computerism, teachers still 
encourage children to write with their hands is because the biggest part of your brain that is represented in something in medicine we call the homunculus, the biggest part that is taken by it is by your hands. And when you use your hands often, your brain is stimulated to remember things, okay? And so when we come to church and simply sit, I will ask you at the end of the year how many sermons you can remember from last year, and you'll probably remember one or two because, you know, you never took time to document, isn't it? Yeah? Today we live in a society where people think they can take notes by taking screenshots, isn't it? But how much of that do you remember, students? You don't remember anything, isn't it? But how much of your notes do you remember? You even remember it's on this page, I've written it in red, the, the title is in green, right? Yeah? When you use your hands. And so even when it comes to the work of God, I do encourage you to take as many notes as you can, for very soon you will need all this knowledge and all these sermons that are shared in the house of God. So what's the first thing I shared? What's my first concern? Number two? Number three? Mission and vision. So if you forget any other thing, I need you to remember those three things. Number one? Number two? And number three? Mission and vision. And to the first thing on generational health, Today's weekend morals and weekend immunity and weekend health is as a result of a weekend gene out of a lifestyle of sin. Families ought to be careful for out of our daily habits, our generations are preserved in health or given a weakness which they pass down to other generations. Health can be commanded down our generations or disease passed down and a shameful heritage, as a shameful heritage of our unthoughtful life. And so looking at the life of Abraham and at the life of Noah, I don't think that God was simply referring to their spiritual life alone, but also the health heritage that they were handing down to their children. And where do I get this? As we study further in the, book, in the Bible, Judges chapter 13 verse 5, we find the story of Mr. and Mrs. Manoah. The word of God comes to them and it says in Genesis 13 verse 5, the Bible says, For lo, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child should, shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And in verse 7, the Bible says, of Judges 13, But he said unto me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine or strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Question, who was the Nazarite? Samson or Mrs. Manoah? Samson. So why was Mrs. Manoah being told not to take any strong drink, not to touch any unclean thing? Yet Samson was the Nazarite, not Mrs. Manoah. The reason why Mrs. Manoah was being enjoined in the Nazarite vow, because the Nazarite vow consisted of not touching any unclean thing, not eating of any un un unclean meat. Why she was en enjoined in this is because anything she did was handed down to her generations. Now, there is a law of influence which we often forget, and influence exists in our homes in two areas, in the area of inheritance and in the area of environment. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 561, this writer, Ellen G. White, writes, as the result of parental intemperance, children often lack physical strength and mental and moral power. Liquor drinkers, tobacco users may and do transmit their insatiable craving, their inflamed blood, and irritable nerves to their children. Now, the next thing is our home environments. Today, we live in environments where we have divorce, polygamy, brokenness, fatherlessness, substance abuse, sexual ab abuse, quarrels, unfairness, and simply bad examples. So when you see a lack of weddings even in our churches, it's not that the young people don't want to get married. It could be the example set forth in the house of God is bad. 
and nobody would want to continue in the example set forward. Some of our home influences simply give us baggage that we carry on. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 15 verse 33 that be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. And so I ask yourself today, what genetic loading are you giving your children out of one, the type of genes that you bear today, the type of food you eat, the type of lifestyle you live, if a child is to come out of you, are you going to be proud that, you know, I, I passed down very good genes? Or are you simply propagating disease in your generations? The type of influence you give, for I can clearly tell you from experience, there is a clinic I, I, I work in, and in this clinic, um, occasionally, uh, whenever I go there, you find the biggest cause of disease in this clinic is the anxiety and depression caused by a home full of quarrels, a home full of disorder, and suddenly it manifests in physical symptoms such as increased pressure, um, endocrine disorders like thyroid dysfunction, um, diabetes, arthritis, and so many other chronic illnesses. But if you dig into the history, you simply find that the home influence is, is wrong. Someone is stressed to the core until the body starts manifesting itself. And I do remember a sad story one time. A child born to an alcoholic mother, and there was nothing you could give this child to keep quiet. There was no breast milk that would suffice to make this child quiet. And so what would the nurses do? Take some alcohol and put it on a piece of cotton and bring it to the nose of the child so that the child could be, you know, calm down because the child was an alcoholic from... But, and it's not just, you know, the genes that we give, but sometimes our tempers and moods. Mothers, be careful when you are simply calling out for the weirdest of things in the middle of the night because you're pregnant. Oh, I want the rocks from Kisi. And your husband has to run around in the middle of the night to get you, you know, avocados from wherever. Soon you will have a child throwing tantrums in the supermarket but where did it come from? A wife who was throwing tantrums, isn't it? At night, I, I must have this food, I must have it now. And when your child presents with the same behavior, you complain. But where did it come from? We don't just transmit bad genes, we also transmit tempers and behaviors. And I didn't say that, it comes from the, the pen of inspiration. Today's lifestyle and chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, polycystic ovarian syndrome, sickle cell anemia, cancer, among many others, run in families because none in the family would care to interrupt the cycle of disease. Weaker and weaker do the generations after become due to an indolence to examine the cause and to mitigate it. The second thing is the mindset. And we still learn this from the story of, of Noah and also the life of Abraham. A preservation of strong genes requires a different mindset and sometimes even a change of environment. The first mindset is a mindset of faith. Noah, living in an age where no rain had been seen, was enlightened in, by faith and he saw by faith a flood and destruction coming and he was willing to begin building an ark for the salvation of himself and his family. By faith he saw in his day the judgment of the Lord on the acts of daily living such as marriage, eating and drinking that were carried out in excess and inappropriate ways. Like the Bible says in Luke chapter 17 verse 26 and verse 32, like as it was in the days of Noah, men were eating and drinking and giving in marriage, so shall it be in the current day. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in today's day. There is no problem in marrying, there is no problem in eating and drinking, but in the way in which it is carried out, many sin and offend God, and the judgments of God will soon be meted out against our practices. By faith, Noah saw these things. He saw that common sense was not common to everyone in the use 
of plants that no animal would otherwise use, such as tobacco and tea, in our day. Rebellion was praised as bravery as men gave up marrying women and married fellow men. For him to survive the coming period of difficulty, he needed a different mindset, a mindset of faith to obey the commandments of God even when there was no scientific evidence for the same. For men in those days were busy living the principle of we only live by scientific evidence. For in those days, there was no scientific evidence for rain, but Noah stood and preached and said that there is rain coming. A few years ago, there was no scientific evidence that tobacco was causing any illness. In fact, many physicians prescribed tobacco in their practice. Many of them freely used of tobacco. But God in his mercy, in the book of Amos chapter 3, the, the Bible says that the Lord surely does nothing except he reveals it to who? His servants, the prophets. God revealed it to a prophet of this church and he told, he told her that tobacco use is harmful in all its forms. And when she said it, everyone looked at her and said, you're psycho. There is no scientific evidence for this. A few years later, whatever she said in 1868 and the years after was proved to be true. Today, so many illnesses, so many cancers are linked to the use of just one time tobacco use or even just being in the environment of tobacco. The same writer has warned about the use of meat in this day and age, the use of milk in this day and age. But of course, Adventists are still waiting for scientific evidence. They're waiting for the news to give um, evidence that fish in Lake Nakuru is not safe for consumption. Did you see that in the news this week? Did you have to wait for that, for you to stop eating fish? And so we are busy waiting for scientific evidence, but I will tell you, like it was in the days of Noah, those who waited for scientific evidence were destroyed by the floods, isn't it? Happy are they who live by faith, for the Bible tells us they just shall live by faith. I know the preaching of the gospel is as foolishness to those who are perishing. And so the things that are shared in the health message, which is the right hand of the gospel, sometimes will seem as foolishness to those who are perishing from disease. He was told, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall you make in the ark, which shall pitch it within and without a mindset of faith is needed to do that which God is asking us to do, even when there is no evidence. And it's not just a mindset of faith. For some will say, oh, I believe. Reminds me of the story of this people, a man who visited the Niagara Falls. And on the Niagara Falls, someone was carrying um, others on a wheelbarrow across the Niagara Falls. And they were walking across, you know, a very thin line. And he said, oh, now I see it, I actually believe it. But he was asked, okay, now that you have seen it and you believe it, can you step in so that you also walk across? And he said, no, 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 I believe it, but I, I can't, I can't do it. And some of us are in church and you're like, yes, I believe these things are true. But when it comes to the actual practice of it, we stay behind not willing to follow through with God's commandment. And that brings us to the second mindset of living and cleaving. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. The command to leave is given to all who choose to start a family and those who are part of families. The Bible, say, the Bible says, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Leaving entails abandoning all that was associated with your previous land in affections, in custom, and in thought. All that is ungodly needs to be left and buried in the past. Indeed, Many a home today is suffering psychological disorders for a lack of living. 
Many a husband is depressed because their wives would not speak as their mothers would or cook as their mothers did. Great too is a wife's depression because the things in her new home do not appear as her old, as her old home. Depression and anxiety disorders manifest in a lack of sleep, weight problems, reduced immunity, hypertension, digestive disorders, all this simply for a refusal to live. And some of us cling to custom, isn't it? It's part of our culture, isn't it? People in Western must eat uh, a little chicken. In fact, these are just flying vegetables, right? You would not leave culture. Be very careful when your church starts defending traditions of the church and traditions of how the church operates. For I am reminded of a time when a church was keen on protecting traditions on how the church operates. And guess what? They missed the Savior for protecting tradition. And Jesus gave them judgment and told them, Woe unto you Pharisees, for you have decided to uphold the commandments and traditions of men more than the commandments of who? Of God. When you are so keen to protect all the tradition of Creta, the tradition of the Luos, the tradition of our home, against the Bible gospel, you will miss the word of God. When you are keen to ask for someone else for the lack of time, you will miss the blessings of God. And oh, I speak on the authority of God, for I have been on the front line watching death coming and death going, and men have been found unprepared. Why? They still want to live under their traditions. And so disease comes and finds a very inflamed body. And I can tell you the difference between death and life, even in COVID, is simply a lifestyle or what you have given your body before. For some will get it and survive, and others, just based on their bodies, they go. And so I will not tire to preach here today, for I know that there is a cloud gathering, and people in our day and age, like in Noah's age, are busy waiting for scientific evidence, isn't it? They're still living their traditions. Oh, I'll tell you, in a day and age when men ought to be waking up early to church, they'll come to church at 10 o'clock, 11, and feel nothing about it. No prayer is offered. In fact, the preacher is urged to keep the sermons as short as possible. And while this is kept up with, Men are sleeping for when they go to their homes, the same people who cannot stand a sermon longer than an hour can stand watching a football match that lasts for an hour and a half and even go for overtime, isn't it? They will stand and watch a two-hour movie and watch series the whole night. But in the house of God, the ministers of the gospel are too mean with the word of God. Lord, have mercy on us, for I can see the clouds clearly gathering, and the flood is surely coming. And if you think the pandemic is over, wait. The third thing is a mindset. I'm sorry, the second thing is a mindset. And it's not just a mindset of faith, but a mindset that is willing to live and also cleave. For those who are willing to live and follow God, he says he giveth them sleep. Psalms 127 verse 2. Others stick to old ways of preparing food, such as the use of ghee and animal fat to prepare meals, simply loading themselves with disease after. Or how about the habit of taking tea and coffee, because that is what we are used to. Choosing to remain prisoners of our past pulverizing habits can only lead us to miss out on the land of promise and opportunities. Being preserved through pandemics requires one to live and live differently. Look at Abraham. Abraham not only left his people behind, 
He left his friends, his family, idolatry, but he was willing to cleave to the promises of God. Yes, he blundered many times, but he was willing to constantly learn and correct his actions according to God's leading. Doesn't the Bible say in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 6, therefore shall a man, in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 6, that whoever God loves, he corrects, isn't it? And so the word of God is sent to create a SDA church this afternoon, not to step on your toe, but because God loves you so much and you still have life, he sent his word to chasten us and to correct us. When he prevaricated in saying that Sarah was his sister, he was willing to pick his wife back, repent, and move on in God's leading. When he made his own plans and sired Ishmael out of wedlock, he was willing to part with his son and concubine that he may obtain the favor and blessing of the Lord. Too few today are willing to part with the things that cause them the biggest health problems. A man would rather endure headache, migraine, and even heart attack to hide his mistress than take the effort to straighten out his life and his home. A woman would rather bear the heavy weight borne by poor eating and imbalanced hormones than make changes to her table. By faith and perseverance in observance of, God com of God's command, we find healing. The man Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 14 found his healing in obediently dipping himself in the dirty waters of the Jordan, not once, but seven times, until complete obedience had been fulfilled. I know sometimes in our living, you'll eat once and you'll expect, you know, um, healing to come immediately. But sometimes, our good and healthy lifestyle does not offer immediate results. Look at the life of Naaman. When he went in once, did the leprosy disappear? No. He had to do it consistently until the fullness of obedience had been reached. Question, have you obeyed God fully in following all the health principles that he has given us? The third thing, the third and final thing is our mission and vision. Noah's home operated on a vision brought directly from heaven. It was this vision that gave the blueprint of the ark and guided their occupation for about a century. To every home in the Adventist church, God has given a blueprint of how we ought to live. The health message was given to guide Adventists for such a time as this. It was to help us be mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually able to fulfill the mission of our time and take the three angel messages to our world in our generations. But today, ask an average Adventist what the three angels' message is about, and some of them don't even know what there's even a three angels' message existing. In fact, one time, one person was asked, um, so what do your church believe in? And he said, uh, we believe as my pastor does. And the person was asked again, okay, so what does your pastor believe in? And he said, your, my pastor believes in what I believe in. And then he was asked, okay, so what do you and your pastor believe in? And he said, we believe as we believe. And sometimes we act like that in our Adventist church. We have forgotten our own belief system, and you know why? Because our health cannot allow us to mentally, physically, emotionally conceive the times in which we are living. Are there times when God has woken you up to, to pray, to do something, to read? You know, God, God is just speaking to you. I remember once I was going for an interview, and I was seated outside. And I had prayed a lot that morning. And while seated outside, something just told me, read one, two, three things. And I, I went and read. I, I, something else told me, okay, again, read one, two, three. Now, when I went into the interview, the very same things I read outside, in the same order I read them. That's the exact same things I was asked. And I said, 
There is so much power in prayer. There is so much we miss for not praying, for we don't have that experience. Why do you live where you live? Did God explicitly tell you that, hey, boss, wake up. You need your family to do what? To move. Or now you need to build. Or now your children need to go to this school and not that other one. Have you heard God speaking to you? Have you heard God giving you a mission and a vision for your home? You see, it is the vision that God gave Noah that guided his entire occupation in life. And not just his occupation, but the occupation of all his sons. For a century, the two of them became, the, sorry, Noah and his, and his sons became builders of an ark. And they had no lack of job. Today, in the last one year, so many of us were challenged in our occupations, isn't it? Many people were rendered jobless, right? Some students who were going to school and, you know, suddenly you realize tourists are not coming. Do I need to continue with my bachelor's in, in tourism anymore? Or is this thing relevant? You know, it is God who can give you an occupation that never runs out of fashion. It is only God who can give you an occupation that is relevant all through the times of, you know, the times of, 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 of the earth. You know, when people were looking at the sons of Noah, abandoning all um, lucrative professions in that day and age to go and become builders of an ark, they must have thought that this guy is a fool, isn't it? Yeah? But because of God's wisdom, God can show you what occupation to become part of. You see, his work was a work filled both with physical and mental work. For any man to engage in healthful employment, both the mental and physical must be engaged. Um, I'm reading from the book Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene. It says, equalize the taxation of the mental and the physical powers, and the mind of the student will be refreshed. If he is diseased, physical exercise will often help the system to recover its normal condition. When students leave college, they should have better health and a better understanding of the laws of life than when they enter it. The health should be as sacredly guarded as the character. By a sedentary lifestyle at work and at home, many get diseased bodies for the blood often moves sluggly, sluggishly through the blood vessels. How many have you had who suddenly just collapsed? And the reason is they have sat down for so many hours beating deadlines and a clot develops on their lower limbs. The clot travels slowly to their lungs or to their brains and when it goes to their lungs you get something we call a pulmonary embolism and you can only pray for grace for your life to be saved. If it goes to your brain you get a stroke. But where did it come from? A sedentary lifestyle of simply not moving. And so you come from the chair at home to the chair in your car to the chair in your office and back to your bed, right? So that's the life we live today. How then can our bodies not be diseased? Who cheated us that our employment should consist of a life of sitting down only? And so today we fancy those with white collar jobs because they go to a well-furnished office only working for so many millions for them to use the millions later to treat their diabetes, hypertension, arthritis, low back pain, cancers, and every other thing. Yet God had given us a health system that would ensure we live to our ripe old age. You know, I often tell God that I want to die like Moses died, that Moses simply walked to his death. In fact, he went hiking for his death. The Bible says Moses climbed the hill, God called him up the mountain, and not even his eyes were dimmed. God simply said, okay, now it's time to die. How many of you want to die like that? I know I want to die like that. <laughs> all right? Not suffering with all these things, yet God has given us a system that can allow us to live like that. Occupation often dictates diet. 
For when you are so busy only engaging your mental powers, you'll feel like, oh, I am hungry at lunchtime and I didn't get time to cook my lunch. So what do you do? Let's go out, isn't it? You eat food, you don't know how it was prepared, with what fat, what is the content, collect chapombili beans, chips na soda, isn't it? Yeah? What is in that beans? What is in that chips? What fat did they use? How long has it stayed in the fridge? How long has it stayed not eaten? And so every day ask yourself, how many times do you actually eat out? And what are you eating? Now, our mission and vision does not just guide our occupation. It also guides the infrastructure around us. God has always been in the habit of guiding how homes should be built. He says in Psalms 127 that except the Lord build a home, the builders labor in vain. Except he watch over a city, then the watchmen watch but in vain. But look at many of our homes today, too crowded, too complex, um, and does not allow, you know, air to flow through our homes. There is no sunlight for many fear that, you know, the, the seats, the wonderful seats would be spoiled by, by, the sun, by the sun. So they buy very heavy curtains that do not allow the sun to come in to even disinfect the surfaces of the home. It's too crowded until children easily pick diseases and infections from others. It's too crowded that our thoughts don't even get space to think and wonder and think about God. You notice what Abraham did when the space between him and Lot were becoming too crowded. He said, is not the whole world before you? And so, sometimes we act like, you know, we are only confined to Nakuru. There is nowhere else. There is no space somewhere else, isn't it? This, this little city, Nairobi, that's where we must we must live, even if the space is too, is too squeezed. Abraham asked the servant, uh, asked the nephew, is not the whole world before you? For there is something that space does to the mind. And when it's too crowded, circulation becomes difficult. Circulation of air, we breathe in bad air, we get very bad lungs. And when you get a disease like COVID, it becomes easy for lungs like that to easily get get sick. And crowdedness is not just in the size of our homes, but it is in what we keep in our homes. The things you have put, those clothes that you have that are too many, will you ever wear them? You know, I appreciate something that he did when we were getting married. I, I used to hold a lot of clothes. I would wear one dress and repeat it after a year. Yeah? Because there were so many. And shoes, you're like green shoes for this dress, this gold shoes for this one, and this one for this one. He told me, uh, now D, if you're going to become my wife, you can't come to my house with all these things. I want you to only carry five dresses. Now, how many ladies would survive with five dresses? Five, five like this. But anyway, I was in love. And so, <laughs> I'm still in love. And I, I wanted to, to obey, so I packed my bags with only five dresses, and I think I had two or three pairs of shoes. You can imagine, coming from a life where I would never repeat clothes, to a life where, you know, if I wore this one yesterday, naini ya kesho, naini ya kesho ingine, I only have one option, isn't it? That was a, at first it was difficult, but today I look at it like, why do we keep every other thing that we have in our homes? This dress is for dinner. You go for dinner once in a year or once in two years. You never wear it, isn't it? Why do we hold these things? Why have we kept so much in our houses that we simply don't use? And those things gather a lot of dust. And when they gather a lot of dust, people are taxed with cleaning. And when you're taxed with cleaning, you feel like, oh, the work in this house is so much. You never have time to pray because you're always busy cooking or cleaning or arranging things, isn't it? Yeah. Or if not that, you feel like, oh, the work here is too, is too much. You start quarreling over house helps and, you know, I need help. I need one, two, three. I need one, two, three. Do you really need them, isn't it? Do you? Why do we live in crowded spaces? Why have we hoarded so much in our infrastructure? 
And notice that God guided Noah in even the wood that he needed to construct the ark. He guided him to the material. Now, the infrastructure of our homes, the things that we need. You know, when you have a mission and vision, God will tell you, ah, okay, for you to eat more vegetables, I think you're not, you need to start doing fresh juices. You need to start doing um, green juices and green smoothies. So please buy a blender, isn't it? Yeah? In some homes, you'll find some people never think about their infrastructure. Some men think that, um, you know, if you use a mop to mop, that's not mopping. I don't know if men have, exp I mean, women have experienced men like that. Where for you to mop, you have to, you have to bend, isn't it? Your wife has been bending every single day from the day you got married to the age of 50. How can she not complain of low back pain? Yet, if you saw it at the beginning, you'd buy simple tools that help to make work easy. And making work easy in the house is actually a godly principle. And I read about it in Adventist home where the women are not to be constantly engaged in coming from one work to another, from the child to the kitchen to the bedroom to every other thing, for they never get time to pray and to read the word of, to read the word of God. And so if men would think that this home needs equipment and infrastructure that makes work easy, you'd find people surviving and even becoming healthier for longer, yeah? In the construction of the ark, Noah and his family did not get sick. They stayed in an ark for about a year. You'd expect that in wet conditions around, where everything around you is, is wet, yeah? And you are in a crowded environment with animals and all these other conditions, we, you'd expect that you'd get things we call zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that come from animals to, you know, to, to man. They didn't get any of that. You'd expect that he'd suffer from things like scurvy. Not once does the Bible record that Noah and his family ever got sick. Why? Because the construction of their abode or of their, um, of their home in this period was guided by the hand of God. I'll ask you, in that home you're constructing, in the setup of your home today, does it follow God's principles? As I conclude, there are three principles I want to share with you. I want to write this down. The first principle is simplicity. The second is selectivity. And the third is systems. I call them principles of health. And the health systems at home revolve around the following seven areas which you want to write down. One is leadership, two is human resource, three is an inventory of products, four is operations, five is health intelligence, six is infrastructure, and seven is health finance. Leadership is someone who gives direction. In our home, he's very consistent when it comes to giving leadership in exercise. I give leadership when it comes to food and other things of health. Human resource is everyone in your house is actually a healthcare worker. From your household to the child, everyone in that house is a healthcare worker. And they ought to know everything concerning about their health. And that is about health intelligence. If you consider everyone a healthcare worker, you'll invest in your house help in teaching them how to do simple first aid. I know children who have died because they were left with a, a, a house manager and the child started choking. The house manager did not know what to do and the child died. But if you considered it a requirement that everyone coming to your house needs to have knowledge of their health, of how to prepare meals, of how to do first aid, then you'd find guarding our health at home becomes easier. Number three is an inventory of products. In my house, I have a list of products which he is aware that if I send him shopping, I'm sure he will not, he will not struggle calling me at ah, mafuta ya nyumba tunatumianga gani? I know some wives, you have that problem. You don't even want him to go shopping because he will be on your neck calling. Now, sabuni na kuanga gani? Mafuta, kujipaka tunanuanga gani? That's what some men will ask, yeah? 
It's because you don't have an inventory of products which everyone knows. I, 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 I like sharing what we use at home and I tell him, we use this because of this. We use this lotion because of one, two, three things. So that in case he goes to the market and he's looking for a product and the one we use is not there, he can use the principles to buy another one that is close to the one that we use at home. Yeah? So do you have an inventory of products in your home that in our house, we always use this rice, we buy it from here, we use these vegetables, we buy it from here, and everyone is aware about them. The fourth thing is operations, and operations is your day-to-day -day living. And you find in the operations of Noah that his operations were mixed with building the ark and preaching and also living his daily life. If in your operations God is not part of it, there is no devotion, there is no repetitive pattern. You know that in this house people wake up at this time, we go to sleep at this time, everyone always sits at the table, it's recipe for disease. The fifth thing is health intelligence, and this is knowledge about health. I know people or children who have been abused, and they only came to know about the abuse because they didn't have any health knowledge. They knew about the abuse when they were older. And we learn about this because we travel a lot to many churches, and in every church we have gone to, we meet young people who tell us that, hey, I was abused as a child. And how did it happen? You find, you know, parents name private parts as doo-doo, nini, isn't it? Yeah? And they never call, they, they never teach children to name their body parts for what they are, isn't it? And you find children are abused in the presence of your own home just simply out of a lack of health intelligence. Sixth is infrastructure, which we've spoken about, and the seventh and final thing is health finance. I'll ask you a question. Who do you think financed Noah's building and Noah's evangelistic campaign? It came from his pocket, isn't it? He financed everything about his health. He financed everything about the evangelistic campaign. And a lot of the times in our homes, we don't decide where our money goes. We need to set our priorities in order. For when we set our priorities in order, you will find that putting money to your health, especially before your health becomes worse, is always the best information. And as Noah obeyed God, you find his sheep settling on top of a mountain. Many have longed for a mountaintop experience in their careers, a mountaintop experience in their health, a mountaintop experience in their marriages. But I will tell you, you only get to the mountain when you are keen on obeying God, when you are keen on living out the things that God has given you. Almost effortlessly, Noah survives the flood and he is settled on top of a mountain. And so today God is willing, God is willing to lead us in everything that we do, that each step we take, that each step we take, our Savior will go before us and with his loving hand he will lead the way. Even when there are pandemics all around, God still leads the way to show us that in everything, his desire is not to settle on the mountains of earth, but to settle us in heaven, in the new Jerusalem. I hope this is your hope and that you'll take each step with Jesus.
will take care of my health and prepare me for heaven. If there is any one such person, I want to invite you to stand as we sing this last stanza. And at the end of the stanza, I'll invite my husband to close with a word of prayer. it seriously that you listened and you picked something, at least one for your home, for your life. God is happy when we are succeeding, when we are healthy. And I just want to pray that in faith we will grasp his promises as we pray. And I want to give a special invitation to each of you for the afternoon session. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you because there is no pandemic, no disease that finds you unawares. Rather, your resources depleted to health. Indeed, you sent them even ahead of time. Thank you because as your people, we have the opportunity to partake of this knowledge and that by faith we can exercise choices in health that are reinforced by your word and upheld by your power. So I pray, Lord, for this church, for choosing to set this day aside to consider their health conversation. I ask, Lord, that your voice will be heard in the words that have been spoken. If there is one that needs to go to our homes and help us reorganize, Lord, I pray that you will give this word power that it will not return to you empty. But, Lord, we will be a people that are healthy. I pray, Lord, that you will help solve the problem behind the problem, which is a sin problem. Calm our anxieties and help us to live free from fear. Help us to walk in faith. Lord, I pray that you will send forth vision and mission for our homes, for our life, for our occupation. For there are source to the, of disease to us. I pray, Lord, that where the health is failing, that you will reach out and touch every family and heal them. Heal every individual, heal every member, even those who have watched and followed online. 
and bless us because we have prayed and believed in faith, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We thank you so much, uh, our sister Diane. We thank God for using you to deliver his message to his children this afternoon. We have come to the end of the morning part of our worship program this day. And as we announced earlier, we have a program in the afternoon that starts at 2.30, both uh, physically for those who can make it and uh, on our online platforms. Do not plan to miss. As we disperse, we want to remind uh, the few groups that were to consult. Number one, the Sabbath School Council. Meet with your leader and consult about the week to come. Those of us who are in the healthcare sector, consult with uh, Brother Walter. And also, we want to encourage us that as we keep getting the updates, please stick to the protocol that we have in place. So as we disperse, let us use the two exits. The entrance will be closed for those of us who are in the church. So let us keep the protocols as we leave. Let us uh, minimize physical interactions. May God bless you as you enjoy your lunch and uh, looking forward to seeing you at 2.30. God bless you. <laughs>